What's up, future respiratory therapists? What is the difference between albuterol and levalbuterol, aka Zopinex? That's what we're talking about in this video. Let's dive in. All right, so everybody wants to know albuterol versus levalbuterol. What's the difference? Let's talk about it. Here's what we have to understand. Before we can understand the difference between them, what we first have to understand is the molecular structure of albuterol. And what you're looking at here is a representation of that. Now, this isn't the exact molecular structure. It's just showing you that albuterol is made up of two isomers. So what we know is we have an R isomer and we have an S isomer. Now, these two isomers together create the molecular formula for albuterol. Now, what we know here is that these two isomers create different responses physiologically. And according to Egan's chapter 36, Egan's talks about the negative effects that come with the S isomer. So we know that it states that it leads to evidence of increased uh, responsivity of the bronchial tissues. What does that mean? That means that it can cause and lead to a greater response to histamine and leukotrienes and ultimately lead to a greater level of bronchoconstriction. And so that's ultimately summarized very quickly some of the key points of what the S isomer does. Now remember they can look at these and say, okay, well what does the R isomer do? Oh, the R isomer, isomer has very specific beta-2 qualities that enhances the beta-2 receptors, which if you remember, are directly responsible for bronchodilation. When they looked at the S isomer, they said, wait a second, what effect does it have on the beta-2? Well, some studies showed that it decreased the responsiveness of these beta-2 receptors. Other studies showed that when given with and in conjunction with an anticholinergic agent, that the reaction on the beta-2 and the, the, the effects on the beta-2 receptors were actually nullified. They were blocked by the anticholinergic agent. So we recognize that what value does the S isomer actually bring to albuterol? Well, the makers of lev albuterol said none. So they came in and they said, you know what, we're going to make the same drug essentially, except we're going to make it without the S isomer. So lead albuterol is essentially albuterol without the S isomer. It's just the R isomer. The R isomer is the isomer of benefit. Now, this is going to make sense here, right? Because if we remember what the adult dose of albuterol is, we know that it is 2.5 milligrams. Say, okay. If I just told you that levalbuterol came in and is similar molecular formula, just minus the half of albuterol formula that causes the, 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 the bad stuff that comes with negative connotations, it's the S isomer. Think of sinister, it's bad. Then they said, well, let's just make it with just the R isomer. And that makes sense why the adult dosage of levalbuterol is exactly half of the adult dose for albuterol. Huh. Interesting, huh? Just take away half and your difference is that our standard dose is now half of your standard dose, 1.25 milligrams. So the question now is, is okay, if you're telling me, Joe, that lev albuterol is just the R isomer, we got rid of the S isomer, which we know we have identified based in research that comes with negative effects, can lead to greater experiences of bronchoconstriction. It, 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 it can be blocked and not have the bronchodilator effect that it's wanted. Then why don't we just always use lev albuterol? That's a complicated question, although it's really not. Because what we know is that evidence shows that the 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 Outcomes associated with lev albuterol versus albuterol are very similar. One does not show superiority over the other. However, lev albuterol is much more expensive. 
Now, I don't know how much more expensive. That's not my area of expertise. I just know it comes with a larger price tag. And that's why it's not the first line beta 2 bronchodilator of choice. <clears throat> because it has a higher price tag that does not yield superior patient outcomes. Actually, Egan's even talks about a study that talks about where they compared a group receiving albuterol and a group receiving lev albuterol, and the length of stay was longer in the lev albuterol group. Now, maybe other factors came into it to, to, to make that happen, but we recognize that you're already using a more expensive drug, and now your patient is staying in a hospital longer. That's even more cost. So we're a long ways away, I believe, from still seeing where lev albuterol, where we can give less drug to get similar outcomes. As long as the price tag is much higher, I don't think we're going to see it. Now, what I do believe is that eventually this will be the beta-2 bronchodilator of choice. I do believe that it will replace albuterol as the first line of choice, but only when the cost changes. And here's why I believe this. If we go back in time, we can look at the evolution of bronchodilators. We had isoproteranol, and there was others before that. I'm just going to start at isoproteranol. It was a beta-1 and beta-2 agonist. And then isoetherine came out, and it said, you know what? We're going to bronchodilate, and we're going to become specific to beta-2 agonists. So isoetherine, which was also called bronchosol, came out, and it said, here we go. But it had an enormous impact on the cardiac system, a very high incidence of tachycardia. So then we saw metaproteranol come out, which was alupent, which was even more beta-2 specific. And then bronchosol was replaced by metaproteranol, just like bronchosol or, or isoetherine replaced isoproteranol. Metaproteranol, alupent, replaced bronchosol. And then we saw albuterol come out and replaced metaproteranol. Why? Because even more beta-2 specific with less cardiac side effects. If you've been around in this game for, for 20 plus years, you remember seeing some of these other drugs and you remember seeing the high incidence of tachycardia and, and tremors and, and, and shakiness, if you will, uh, that came with these drugs. So we're constantly evolving in this world of aerosolized bronchodilator therapy. We're getting more beta-2 specific and finding ways to reduce the negative side effects, but only when it makes sense from a cost perspective and shows superiority in patient outcomes. So metaproteranol replaced isoetherine, albuterol replaced metaproteranol. Now levalbuterol is in the picture, and I do believe that one day it will replace albuterol. That's just my own personal um, guess and prediction. Okay, so that one day if I'm ever right, I can say, told you so. <laughs> Anyways, that's the difference between albuterol and levalbuterol. If you're ever wondering, get into the research. Go read Egan's, and Egan cites these sources that they get these from, right? We've talked about the 1.25 milligram of levalbuterol, but you can also cut that in half, and there's a 0.63 dose, which is exactly half of levalbuterol. Now, the 0.63 dose actually has very similar, very similar outcomes with albuterol, very similar, even more so than the 1.25. The 1.25 showed, showed equal bronchodilation but had a longer effect with the same number of side effects. 0.63 results were almost identical to 2.5, 2.5 milligrams of albuterol. And then we know there's also a pediatric dose that's 0.31, which is cutting it even further. And so, we recognize that levalbuterol is in this game. It's playing the game. We'll see at what point, if it ever becomes the primary beta-2 bronchodilator of choice. Now, I appreciate you watching this. I hope you learned something here today about the difference between albuterol and levalbuterol. I want to tell you a few things that I want you to take advantage of here. Uh, these are the courses that I have on my online academy. It's the Respiratory Coach Academy. I want to point this out to you right here. This is my free course. There's a lot of resources in here, cheat sheets related to waveforms, um, ICU prep. You can even find a newly posted 
pharmacology cheat sheet that will outline and show the different drugs that go in different classifications. So, so go get access to that free resources. And if pharmacology is a weak area for you, I just posted my free, my, my basic respiratory therapy pharmacology course um, in this website. It is not free, uh, but it is there to aid your uh, educational journey and priced appropriately. So go check those out. Take advantage of those if you're looking for more educational resources. Uh, here's where you can find me. I'm on all the socials, Instagram and TikTok at Respiratory Coach, Twitter at Coach RRT, Respiratory Coach at gmail.com. Send me an email. I will respond to you. It may take me a while. It gets busy sometimes, but I will respond. And you can always send me a text, 817-968-7035. Join my texting platform where I send out occasional messages uh, just saying, hey, how you doing? I don't overwhelm this. This isn't an every day, every week, or even sometimes even every month thing. But occasionally I say, hey, I just want you to be great today. I see it's your birthday. I say, hey, happy birthday. So you can join me there. You can also find me on LinkedIn at Joe Lewis. Thank you for watching. Appreciate you guys so much. Remember, average is easy. Don't be it.